because what you don't know about energy can kill you. Here's Alex Epstein. Welcome to Power Hour. I'm Alex Epstein. Well, I've had probably dozens of consecutive shows with guests, and this week I am going to be the guest. And in particular, I want to talk about an issue that's probably of general interest, but in particular of interest to people who are new to my ideas, which is the issue I call, how can so many experts be so wrong about energy? Or maybe a better way of putting it is, how can, quote, the experts be so wrong about energy? And this is a question that comes up in particular when people hear my views on energy in general and fossil fuel in particular, because I'm making the case that fossil fuel use is so good that we need way more of it in the world. And for you as an individual, that one of the best things you can do in terms of improving the world is promoting more fossil fuel use in the future. And this is just a view that is completely at odds with what we hear is the, you know, the expert view. We're, what we're told is, you know, the consensus of virtually all experts is that we're morally obligated to rapidly eliminate fossil fuel use to prevent catastrophic or apocalyptic climate change. So what, again, what you're hearing is we need to get rid of this. And then occasionally you hear some people say, yeah, we can't get rid of it as slow as as quickly as we would like. But then here's somebody else saying, "No, we need way more of this. That's a moral imperative. Getting rid of it is apocalyptic. Even trying to get rid of it is catastrophic, and you fighting for more of it is heroic." And so there's a natural response to say, "Well, like really, how could the experts be so wrong. And I want to I want to make the case that I I shouldn't be right or somebody contradicting the experts shouldn't be right and then I'll I'll address why I think it's very possible quote the experts can be extremely wrong and, and are so in energy. So, but if you think about let's talk about the value of experts. In a modern specialized society, we rely on specialists, which is basically what experts are. So they have expertise in some specific domain. Uh, to help us evaluate crucial issues. You can think about the example of a plumber, like, okay, you fix a leak in your home. Uh, You think about something like what to do about COVID-19, and there are questions of which experts were best there, but there's no doubt that you need somebody who knows stuff about viruses um, and, you know, how they transmit or not through a population and how they get, you know, how you can, if not cure them, you know, how you can treat people with them and how you can vaccinate with them and what the side effects of that are, et cetera, et cetera. You know, you need all of those kinds of, of things. And so we, we should value, uh, expertise, And so on this issue of energy, you know, we're told by trusted source after trusted source that there's this virtually unanimous expert consensus in this idea, as I said, that we have to rapidly eliminate fossil fuels to prevent catastrophic climate change, which I call the moral case for eliminating fossil fuels. And part of the idea is the expert consensus says this, and this is clearly necessary for the long term and and even not that long term. But, you know, there are certain kinds of short-sighted people, particularly in the fossil fuel industry, who want to prevent that. And then there are their alleged stooges, like sometimes people think I am, uh, which is definitely not true. But, you know, you you get that. And it's like, yeah, this is, it's clear. Everyone knows there's this moral imperative to rapidly eliminate fossil fuels. And, you know, you'll hear some details about it, like, well, okay, fossil fuels emit CO2, and that's a greenhouse gas, and that's causing warming, And then the warming is going to cause all these other consequences. And those are going to be really difficult to deal with. And so clearly we need to get rid of this. And, um, and, you know, then in terms of what we do to replace it, it's, we need to use uh, non-carbon forms of energy, uh, especially green or renewable, so to speak, solar and wind uh, energy. So this is, you know, this is what we hear, the moral case for eliminating fossil fuels. And I just want to stress, you know, the, the level of support among, 
you know, the people we trust for expert knowledge. I'm going to elaborate on that in a minute because that's going to be a key, um, it's going to be a focal point in terms of understanding where, quote, the experts can be wrong. But if you think about like the New York Times, the Washington Post in, in the UK, the BBC, you know, different kinds of trusted mainstream sources like Scientific American, uh, nature, particularly in their public facing things, you know, government facing public statements, you know, the public statements from the UN, which houses the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. You know, we're hearing this message everywhere. And we're hearing it also from corporate America, um, you know, all over the place, all these business interests. And, you know, we think of them as savvy. So are they really going to advocate something that would be really bad for business, as Alex Epstein says is bad for business? So it's it's really a staggering level of uh, you know claim or st- that there is this you know there's this catastrophe and that we're morally obligated to rapidly eliminate fossil fuel use. And so you might think, okay, yeah, the experts, of course, they're not going to be right about everything. They're not going to be exactly right. So they could be a little wrong about this issue. But uh, could they really be totally? in the wrong direction, as Epstein is saying. I mean, this is, how how could that really happen? So with that in mind, I want to read you some quotes from a source that appears to be what some people would call a climate denier uh, source. And, you know, this is the, the kind of thing that contradicts the expert consensus and is regarded as disreputable and uh, destructive. So this is a comment on the issue of, you know, what has been the impact of fossil fuel use on different kinds of climate phenomena. And of course, we're told by the expert consensus that they've had, you know, very dire effects. And then, of course, they will get much worse. So here's this um you know, skeptic or denier source saying, quote, on drought, there is low confidence in a global scale observed trend in drought. And then another one, you know, there is not enough evidence at present to suggest more than low confidence in a global scale observed trend in drought or dryness, in parentheses, lack of rainfall since the middle of the 20th century. Okay, so, or on wildfires, says, global land area burned has declined in recent decades, mainly due to less burning in grasslands and savannas. Okay, so this seems to be, you know, this is challenging the expert uh, consensus. You know, on storms, and here tropical cyclone means hurricane, no significant observed trends in global tropical cyclone frequency. And then numerous studies have reported a decreasing trend in the global number of tropical cyclones and or the globally accumulated cyclonic energy. And then floods, I mean, surely this denier source is not going to uh, challenge that obviously floods are worse as sea levels are rising. It says, in summary, there continues to be a lack of evidence and thus low confidence regarding the sign of trend in the magnitude and or frequency of floods on a global scale. And then it also says flood magnitudes are decreasing. So, you know, when you, you hear something like this, the view is like, why should we believe this when the experts are telling us very clearly, yes, climate is getting a lot worse. It's clearly due to fossil fuels. And these are just deniers and uh, delayers. The problem with that in this instance is that every single thing I just quoted to you came from the official report of the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is considered the authoritative source. And I'm reading directly from it, and it says those things which sound very different from fossil fuels have caused climate change that's catastrophic already, which we hear. So what is going on? Well, what's going on is... When I or other people am saying the experts are wrong or the expert consensus is wrong, what we're not necessarily saying is the actual experts are wrong or totally wrong in their factual conclusions. That's one way 
uh, experts can be wrong. And that can definitely happen. And it's important to know that. But it would be understandable if particularly coming from someone like me who's by background a philosopher, you might think, okay, like, why am I going to trust that he is right, that all these climate scientists are wrong? But that's not my argument. My argument is that one of my arguments, rather, for how, quote, the experts are wrong is the actual experts are being misrepresented. They're being misrepresented. So this is what's happening in this case where the actual experts, and, and not to say this is a perfect summary, but I think this is a summary of most people's view in the field from the UN. In this case, I think they tend to be better with backward-looking things than forward-looking things, which are much more uncertain and prone to different kinds of manipulation. So what's happening at least in this instance is that the actual views of experts are being misrepresented by what I call the knowledge system. And so this is not it. I mean, it's a term that I don't know if anyone else uses this. I think I, 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 you know, I would like to popularize it. Um, and the reason I like, I like knowledge system instead of it's often put as like, oh, things are misrepresented by the media, but I don't think that fully captures it. So the idea of the, the knowledge system is that there's a set of institutions that we rely on to help us acquire and evaluate uh, expert knowledge. So, um, you know, there's, we need expert knowledge. That's very crucial. We can't get it all ourselves. So we need different institutions uh, that help us. And part of that is there are different kinds of research institutions and synthesis institutions that we don't really interact with. The ones we interact with are what you could call like distribution, knowledge distribution institutions. So it's a little bit of a mouthful, but that would be like New York Times, Washington Post, but also, you know, PR departments of government agencies, of scientific agencies, of different kinds of, you know, scientific associations, certain kinds of public journals. So I think of all of those as, you know, the distribution institutions of the knowledge system. And those institutions, we're really trusting them to be our experts on experts. So when we hear, oh, the experts have come to this conclusion that we need to rapidly eliminate fossil fuel use, we are trusting those distribution institutions that they are representing that accurately. And what we know from experience is that is very easy to not be the case. So, you know, an example we had recently with uh, COVID, where there's still a lot of debate over what exactly is the case. But, you know, when you looked at different kinds of surveys, I saw some, I need to find the documentation. So I w don't exactly quote me, but I, I remember seeing this pretty vividly. Like there were studies that said uh, when they were surveying people, like how deadly is COVID-19 to you? Like what's the fatality rate if you get it? And people were saying numbers over 5%. So they thought like more than one in 20 people are going to get this. And this is something like 20 times most experts' view of reality, certainly well over 10 times most experts' view of reality. And so this wasn't a case where the issue isn't that the actual experts thought this, it's that actual experts were misrepresented by the knowledge system, particularly by distribution institutions, uh, and that's what led to this. So when we're thinking about what we hear the experts say, we have to, always have to remember that there is a knowledge system that is, you know, is our conduit to experts and that they can be easily misrepresented. So to say that, quote, the experts, you know, the expert consensus is wrong or is exaggerating the negative climate impacts of fossil fuels, that's not the same as saying that the actual, uh, you know, the average actual scientist, that can happen too. Uh, but that's not my main claim. My main claim is actually if you properly understand and evaluate what even the average climate scientist says, they believe it's consistent with using more fossil fuels. Now, they don't think this, but this gets to the other way in which the expert, the alleged expert consensus, I'll put it that way, the alleged expert consensus can be wrong. So one, you know, one way is it can just be they're factually mistaken, Number two 
is that their factual conclusions can be misrepresented. And then number three is that their factual conclusions uh, can be misevaluated. And this can apply whether it's true factual conclusions, accurately represented or not. There's always the issue of still what I call misevaluation. So what do I mean by misevaluation? I mean that you are taking a certain factual conclusion, factual claim, and then you are drawing from it an evaluation, a statement of right and wrong that doesn't necessarily follow from those facts. So if we take the example of COVID um, again, there are certain facts or factual conclusions about, okay, how deadly is this? And those are important. But even if somebody ends up being totally right about that, it's possible for them to draw the wrong evaluations for policy if they don't consider the full context of other relevant factors. So for example, something that wasn't criticized enough back then, but I think is more criticized now, is that people were evaluating COVID policy only with the goal of preventing deaths from this virus, which is certainly an important kind of of goal for somebody to pursue at least. Um, But they were not considering the many adverse, including deadly consequences of trying to prevent COVID deaths at all costs. So things like, you know, like people don't get to their cancer treatment. People don't get, uh, you know, different kinds of tests done to do uh, early detection, you know, including also just people don't go outside. People uh, aren't healthy. There are all these other things that weren't really being considered. And now I think it's pretty widely criticized that, yeah, it wasn't right to just look at this danger and not look at the full context of relevant factors. Um, And that can lead to the wrong evaluation, in my view. It led to the wrong evaluation in terms of very extended uh, lockdowns when that had a lot of harmful consequences. I don't want to get too much into that, but I think the main point is that uh, maybe I should think of a less controversial example, but that it's possible to go from facts, even, you know, factual conclusions, including totally true ones, and then come up with an evaluation that doesn't make sense um, uh, at all. I mean, a historical one is another kind of controversial issue, but I think it's a good illustration, is if you take like the factual conclusion that intelligence has a genetic component, which I think most people in genetics think, and it's very plausible to me, um, and you take that, and yet there were people in the early 1920s where they evaluated that like their evaluation of that in terms of policy was, oh, let's sterilize people that we evaluate as dumb. Like this was a normal thing in many parts of the U.S. And for me, that does not follow at all. The fact that some people, there's more genetic, uh, you know, proclivity toward intelligence does not mean that people uh, who are less intelligent cannot pursue their dream of having kids. I think you need certain, I think just the policies are, I mean, this is another controversial issue, but I think just in general, you need to have policies where people take responsibility for stuff. But I think it's totally wrong to say, oh yeah, well, your IQ is not 145, so you can't pursue your happiness. Like that's, that's a terrible thing, but that was a common view. So again, that's a case of you're taking uh, a true factual conclusion, but you're leading to a total uh, misevaluation of it. And so what I think is going wrong, what my case is for how the alleged expert consensus can be so wrong is mainly, one, is that the actual views of experts are being wildly misrepresented. But most important uh, of all is that the facts in question are being wildly misevaluated. And that's what I want to focus on for probably the rest of this podcast, and then I might need to do some more because there's a lot more that I want to cover. And when it comes to misevaluating fossil fuels, I think that with a little bit of observation, I think anyone will agree with what I'm going to say, which is that there's something really wrong with the method by which we are um, morally evaluating fossil fuels, by which we are saying, like, 
this is good, this is bad, this should be eliminated, this should be kept. There's something very, very wrong. And my summary is that we are, you know, the knowledge system is supporting the elimination of fossil fuels without ignoring its massive life or death benefits. So it's it's advocating the elimination of something without by while ignoring its benefits. So how do I get to that conclusion? Um, so I think anyone would agree if we are morally evaluating, hey, what do we do about any product and any technology? We need to carefully consider not only the negative side effects of the technology. So in this case, people are concerned about pollution. Above all, they're concerned about the consequences of CO2 emissions. And all those are very legitimate to be concerned about and to study. But of course, you need to look at the benefits. So if you think about something like an antibiotic or a vaccine, yeah, we'd all agree. Okay, you need to look at negative side effects, but you also need to consider um, benefits. And I think most of us would say it's very disreputable if somebody's just focusing on negative side effects and they're ignoring the benefits. That could lead you to terrible, terrible um, conclusions. So I, when I started getting into energy in about 2007, I quickly concluded that this same mistake of advocating the elimination of something uh, while ignoring its massive life or death benefits was happening with fossil fuels, um, as well as I'll argue was and is happening with other forms of energy, which is very um, interesting, which will, will prove very interesting. I'll talk about that as well today. Now, before 2007, before I got into energy, this didn't occur to me in part because I didn't think fossil fuels had any massive life or death benefits. And there are two reasons for that. One is I'd never been taught much about the importance of energy, so I didn't think much about energy in general. And then also I'd been taught that any benefits of fossil fuels are easily replaceable by um, alternatives. And so I thought, okay, well, there's nothing, there's no real benefit to using this that we can't get just as easily from anything else. So yeah, I didn't notice, oh yeah, we're only focusing on the side effects. But yeah, well, I focus on the benefit. It's not that big a deal and we can replace it with other things. And so the three facts that really convinced me otherwise, and I, I considered all these facts in the category of these are undeniable facts, like they are evident once you point them out and they are totally ignored uh, by our knowledge system. So I'll summarize them uh, quickly and you've heard me talk about them in different contexts if you've heard me talk before. So number one is cost-effective energy is essential to human flourishing. So first, what do I mean by cost-effective uh, energy? That is my summary for the idea. Cost-effective is my summary for energy that, that combines several key attributes. So one is being low cost. The second is being on demand or reliable. The third is being versatile, so it works for many different kinds of machines. And then uh, the fourth is that it is on a global scale, including billions of people and thousands of in thousands of places. That's what I mean by cost-effective energy. Those are the dimensions of cost-effectiveness. So, the, you know, and why do I say it's essential to human flourishing? Well, so human flourishing means, uh, you know, human beings' ability to live to their full potential. So human beings living long, healthy, happy, opportunity-filled lives. And so that's, I'm saying that cost-effective energy is essential to that. Now, why is that? Well, the, the basic reason is goes to what energy is. Energy is what I call machine food or machine calories. And so what energy enables us to do is to use machines to improve our lives. More specifically, machines produce value for us. They produce am amounts of value that we could never produce ourselves. So like uh, you know, modern agricultural equipment can produce 700 times as much of certain crops as the best manual labor could. So you're multiplying your ability by 700. So that's a case where it's amplifying our abilities. Uh, but also it can expand our ability. It can create new kinds of value that no number of humans could create. So for example, like a modern incubator, you know, there's no number of humans who can just function as an incubator. And so the, we have this amazing ability to use what I call machine labor. So machines producing 
far more value and far more varieties of value for us. But this all depends on the cost effectiveness of energy because we can only have this to the extent that energy is low cost, on demand, versatile, uh, global scale. So it's essential to human flourishing. That's fact one. And it's not something we ever hear about, but once you point it out, very hard uh, to deny. Then fact number two is that billions of people lack cost effective energy with tragic amounts of suffering and death uh, resulting from that. So story I tell in the moral case for fossil fuels is a story of a hospital where a baby born prematurely who would be incubated in the United States tragically dies because they don't have an incubator. And the reason they don't have an incubator is because they don't have reliable electricity and you need reliable electricity for the incubator. So just the same, the same child in the US would be totally fine. And then it's just life is over forever and the, the, the parent has that tragedy forever. And it's just directly, look, this is lacking. So it, it's, you have that kind of example, but more broadly, it's just a lack of, of cost-effective energy in the entire economy. So it's much more, it's overwhelmingly a manual labor life, which is a very poor and endangered life, versus a machine labor life. And so this is, you know, this should be viewed as a tragedy. So we have, we need cost-effective energy, and then billions of people lack it. So that, you know, the conclusion from that is we need way more cost-effective energy. And then fact three is that fossil fuels are a uniquely cost-effective source of energy. So in terms of those dimensions, low cost, on demand, versatile, on a scale of billions of people in thousands of places, nothing else comes close. Now this is this is one where this issue is talked about to some extent, but it's just simply misrepresented. We hear that, oh yeah, solar and wind are rapidly replacing fossil fuels. This is not remotely true. Uh, in fact, these technologies are, they're mandated. They're subsidized. They are dependent on fossil fuels because they're not controllable. So they depend on fossil fuels. As they're basically parasites. They increase costs and they threaten reliability. And, and still they amount to about 3% of the world's um, energy. And then that energy is also just in the realm of electricity, uh, whereas fossil fuels have like very specific uses in very high levels of heat for industry as and then very cheap uh residential heat that electricity can't really compete with. And then also, of course, mobility, particularly heavy duty mobility. So, you know, right now, fossil fuels are unique, uh, you know, uniquely cost effective source of energy. And that's why they are growing. Despite all the opposition, they're growing, particularly in the developing world. And China is a good example where we hear that China is using less and less, but they are using more and more. And they're currently 85% fossil fuel with plans for expanding fossil fuel use in the future. So you have these facts, which is we've got something cost-effective energy is essential to human flourishing. Billions of people lack it, meaning we need far more of it. And fossil fuels have a unique ability to produce it. And yet our knowledge system, so what, what does this imply? This implies that there are massive life or death benefits to using fossil fuels going forward. Most obviously, for the billions of people who lack cost-effective energy today, uh, but also for the billions of people who have it and may well lose it if we try to replace it with something else, given that all the something else is so far are nowhere near uh, what fossil fuels can do. And even if you're pretty optimistic about these things, it's very far-fetched that they're going to replace what fossil fuels do in the near future. Um, I mean, very, very, very far-fetched. And then beyond that, what's needed, like all the energy that's needed. So clearly, like there's a lot of benefit to using more fossil fuels going forward. That means more people get to use machines to improve their lives in a world that desperately needs that. So this doesn't mean that there aren't side effects and it doesn't even preclude, there could be side effects that overwhelmed those benefits. Although those would have to be really big side effects, particularly from, from climate. But you have to at least admit, okay, there are massive benefits to fossil fuels and nobody is talking about these facts. And so that is something I found very disturbing because it is saying, we're saying let's eliminate this, but let's not talk about the thing, the fact that they provide this thing that is essential, that billions of people need, and that they currently have a unique ability to provide, um, you know, unique by a long shot. So this, this is a big 
this is really bad method of moral evaluation if this is actually what's going on. Of like, yeah, we're talking about eliminating something, we're calling it evil and saying it needs to be eliminated, and we're not looking at the benefits. We're just looking at, at negative side effects. Um, now, you might think like, okay, yeah, I kind of recognize, you know, when I'm mainstream media, I don't hear about this, but it can't really be that they are, you know, that the experts advocating uh, eliminating fossil fuels, that they are really ignoring these benefits. Like, that can't really be happening. And so I think it's important to look for, this is true of anything, you want to really look for, okay, what are the best arguments uh, for this? And for this, I think, you know, where I've turned and where I'd recommend others turn is look at what I call the designated experts of the knowledge system. So the designated experts are, they are the ones who specifically are treated as the spokesman representative of the best experts. So if you look at the designated experts, and you know they're the one, and you look at their arguments for this thing the knowledge system says is true, then we're going to get a good idea of how high quality the arguments um, are. And so the short version of this is: so you might think like, you know, the plausible th things you could think of. Actually, let me let me scratch that because I want to I want to uh, move on to some other points, and, and I don't want this to go too long. So. I just say that if you look at the, so looking at like, so some people I've looked at are, you know, I'm looking for longstanding designated experts who are very prestigious, very influential. So for me, it's includes the public representatives of the UN, a guy named Paul Ehrlich, one of the most longstanding ecologists, uh, John Holdren, who was in the Obama administration, James Hansen, Al Gore, Bill McKibben, Michael Mann, Amory Lovins. And so like looking at them, like look at their arguments for rapidly eliminating fossil fuels and ask like, okay, how did they account for the massive life or death benefits of continuing fossil fuels? Are they observing, are they acknowledging that one, that cost-effective energy is essential to human flourishing, two, it's desperately needed, and three, the fossil fuels have a unique ability to uh, produce it. And the answer is they're almost never acknowledging any of these things. So what you find over and over is they almost never even talk about the value of energy. So I mean, there's so many examples of this, but one I talk about in my next book is, you know, Michael Mann talking, uh, well, actually, maybe I'll, I'll save that one for later. That's a really good one, but it might take a little while to explain. Um, you know, there's a, a paper that in 2019, I believe, where a bunch of scientists, something like 11,000 scientists, including Paul Ehrlich, and they said, okay, we got to get off fossil fuels. And it was like, world scientists declare climate emergency. There's not one mention of the value of energy. They just said, oh yeah, leave fossil fuels in the ground, replace them. But there was like not one mention of the value of this or any, or certainly the need for more of it in the world. You almost never see any mention of the need for more um, energy in the world in these calls to rapidly eliminate fossil fuels, even among, you know, the designated experts. It's not just, oh yeah, New York Times editorial left it out. It's like, no, the designated experts have long books and leave it out, um, or long documentaries in the case of Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth, which is probably the most influential single thing. No mention of the value of energy at all. And um, do they... Do they, you know, you might think, well, okay, well, do they, they're just really confident about replacement? Well, if they're confident about replacement, the first thing they need to do is acknowledge that, yeah, co fossil fuels are currently uniquely cost effective, but it, they don't do that. They totally misrepresent that situation. They deny that it exists, and then they make very flimsy uh, claims where they really seem to have no interest in the details. So I invite you to look at designated experts, but I think you'll find this over and over and over. There's no mention, uh, very little mention of the value of energy very little mention of the need for more of it, and no mention or denial of the unique, um, you know, the uniqueness of fossil fuels are producing cost-effective energy. So this is not okay. This is very disturbing. So this is really a problem. We're talking about eliminating our most, by far most cost-effective source of energy without acknowledging the value of it and without acknowledging its, its unique role in producing it. So this is just really, it's exactly like, oh, let's ban vaccines and not talk about the massive benefits that will be lost. And as bad as that is, it actually is even uh, worse 
than that. Because fossil fuels are not the only type of energy that is widely opposed in our society, where you know a lot of projects are being stopped or eliminated. Um, there is also widespread opposition to nuclear energy and to hydroelectric energy. And if you've heard me talk about those, those are, in my view, the two most cost-effective and, and with nuclear, the most promising because it can scale indefinitely. Those are the two most promising alternatives. Yet there's widespread opposition to them. And in that opposition, there's no mention of the benefits they provide. So it's not just, doesn't seem to be just about fossil fuels. It's there's a real willingness to get rid of, you know, nuclear and hydro as well. And then on top of that, and this is even more disturbing, even with solar and wind, that these, these very optimistic claims are made without evidence, what we see is solar and wind are being widely opposed, not just as opposing subsidies and mandates for them, which I think that's appropriate to oppose that, but the construction of them is being opposed all over the place and transmission lines, which they need a huge amount of transmission lines to interconnect them around the country, those are opposed. And the mining for the materials is opposed. And thus these, um, you know, the, the, the development of them is much slower than the people who claim that they can replace fossil fuels um, say is necessary. And yet there's not much concern about that as well. It's very little reported. Um, whereas you would think like, okay, a knowledge system where people, I mean, surely experts have to know that energy is so valuable and it's so needed. And yet there's opposition to fossil fuels, nuclear, hydro, and even solar and wind. And nobody's talking about the massive life or death benefits of cost-effective energy that will certainly be lost if most or all of these things continue to be opposed. So what's going on? What's going on is there is definitively a systemic devaluing of cost-effective energy. There's simply no other way around it. With technology after technology, if, if it's, if it's, if it is opposed or its elimination is advocated and nobody's talking about its benefits, there is something, there is some devaluing uh, of energy going on. And we have to say it's not even just, it's at minimum a devaluing, like we're not valuing it at all. That's really scary. But there's also just a hostility, at least among some people. You can just see this in, you know, when people are talking about energy, you'll hear people say, yeah, we, you know, we use too much energy. We shouldn't use as much energy. And notice that with every form of energy, there's always seems to be a reason to oppose it, which that that conveys like a general hostility to the uh, phenomenon. So what we have is we have a knowledge system that we're relying on to give us an expert evaluation of what to do about fossil fuels and other forms of energy. And that system clearly just devalues and even has hostility toward cost-effective energy. So this is an absolute disaster in terms of it guarantees that whatever evaluation or knowledge system gives us is going to be way wrong. And that's whatever fossil fuels climate side effects uh, turn out to be. And there are three reasons for it. Whatever the, the climate side effects are, if you don't consider the benefits, you're going to make bad decisions. Like if you don't talk about billions of people not having incubators, not being able to produce food, not having clothing, not having shelter. Like if you don't talk about the role of energy in those and what can be lost, like you're, whatever is happening in terms of storms and floods and those kinds of things, if you only look at those and you don't look at these massive benefits that will be lost, you cannot possibly make a good decision. So that's one thing. But it gets even worse because if you think about what fossil fuels do, which is they give us the ability to use machines to improve our lives, it's pretty clear that one of the values fossil fuels gives us is the ability to neutralize climate dangers, the very things 
that people say they're most concerned about. So you just think about like drought. Well, fossil fuels allow you to irrigate to alleviate drought. They allow you to do have drought relief drought relief missions for, you know, heat. They allow you to cool yourself. And for cold, they allow you to warm yourself. And for all the other things there, you know, for storms, they allow you to build sturdy buildings. And so if we're not talking about the benefits of cost-effective energy, uh, including cost-effective energy from fossil fuels, how are we, like, we're not going to evaluate the side effects at all because we're not going to, we're going to totally ignore our ability to at least partially neutralize them with the benefits of fossil fuels. And then the third reason is we're guaranteed to have a wrong evaluation is, or at least we should be suspicious, is that if we've got a knowledge system, including designated experts, that have this devaluing and really hostility toward cost-effective energy, that is cause for suspicion that there is a bias that could cause them to misrepresent fossil fuels, climate side effects. And I already gave some evidence that that's happening in terms of what the UN said, the IPCC said versus what is reported. Uh, but I think in general, you know, any time somebody ignores the benefits um, of something, you know, when they're, when they oppose something and they don't talk about its benefits, uh, we should be suspicious of their claims about its its side effects. So when somebody says like, oh, I, you know, if somebody says, I, I oppose all, I want to get rid of all vaccines. And they say they have these terrible side effects and they don't talk at all about the benefits of vaccines. I, there's something driving them that's irrational um, that could easily be driving them to be misrepresenting the side effects. So we need to be on the lookout for that. And I'm going to talk next time uh, about what we can observe about our knowledge system and the side effects of fossil fuels. Because it turns out it's even worse, particularly if you're new to my, my views, than you could possibly imagine in terms of what, what do we know about the knowledge system's uh, practices in terms of misrepresenting the side effects of fossil fuels, but also of other forms of cost-effective energy, particularly nuclear. But what I want to wrap up with is just, um, so this may be, this will either be a two-part series or three-part series. I hope you enjoy it. But in terms of this question of how can the experts be wrong, uh, you know, the, the key thing today is that, so there's the kind of more minor point, but an important point is that knowledge systems can misrepresent experts' factual conclusions. That's an important thing. There's going to be more about that next week. But the major point is that knowledge systems can misevaluate the facts. And in this case, what we see very clearly with our knowledge system is that it is misevaluating whatever facts there are about fossil fuels negative side effects because it is advocating the elimination of not only fossil fuels. So I would just say it's it's misevaluating all cost effective energy because it's advocating its elimination without considering its massive life or death benefits. So it's it's advocating the elimination of cost-effective energy um, while ignoring its massive life or death benefits. And this is a totally terrible method of moral evaluation. You cannot make any good decision with this at all. And yet our knowledge system is clearly doing it. Our designated experts are clearly doing it. And so what we can see is this is part one of the recipe for being totally wrong uh, about something, even if all the actual experts were totally right in their factual conclusions. I don't think it's true, and I actually think there are certain distorting factors there, but it really doesn't matter. The main thing is this wrong method of moral evaluation is totally making the alleged expert consensus uh, wrong, and we're gonna see next time that part of this is that, uh, particularly on the issue of side effects, what experts actually think is chronically misrepresented by our knowledge system and has been for decades. And that has been part of why we have a very long track record of our knowledge system promoting totally false catastrophe predictions that actually occur in areas of life where things actually improve. So hopefully that's intriguing. Um, this is 
you know, a lot of new material that I've, it's going to be in fossil future, which should be up soon. I keep telling you it's going to be on the website. It keeps getting delayed a little bit, but, um, yeah, I have a lot more about this issue of experts. I think it's very important, again, particularly for people who are new to my approach to just understand how, what knowledge systems are and how they can go wrong. And I think that more people understand that, the more they can be objective about how our knowledge system is malfunctioning when it comes to morally evaluating different sources of energy. And once we get that, then we can understand what's going wrong there and really what's causing that, which I might talk about in a third segment. And once we do that, then we can understand how to fight these problems in the knowledge system and also figure out how to, um, you know, what, what we can do positively to actually figure out the truth if our knowledge system is not going to give it to us. So that is it for this week. As always, if you have any questions, comments, love mail, or hate mail, email me at alex at alexepstein.com. Let's see what else. Uh, any announcements? So as always, check out energytalkingpoints.com for new talking points. I have a new project that's related to energy talking points. It's called the Energy Champions Network. It'll be, there'll be a description of it by the time you hear this on industrialprogress.com. So it's free, but it's limited to certain people. So check out the description, see if you are interested and if you qualify. And if so, send me an email with the information that I request on the website. Uh, Also been doing a lot of stuff lately on Twitter. So make sure to follow me there. And also, if you like the work that I am doing that others like Stefan Henna at the Center for Industrial Progress and our team are doing, you can help accelerate our progress by becoming an accelerator. So to do that, you go to industrialprogress.com slash accelerate. All right, that is it for this week. I will be back. Uh, I'm not sure when I'm going to do the next segment because I have a couple of really good guests lined up, uh, but I expect... I will do some in the form of bonus episodes. And if you really like this episode and approach, feel free to email me and encourage me to do them more quickly. And that will probably work well. All right. Until next time, I'm Alex Epstein. This has been Power Hour. Power Hour. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of energy. Power Hour. The antidote to shallow thinking about energy issues.